This video was brought to you by Brilliant. The first 200 people to use the link below get 20% off an annual subscription. Assuming our YouTube analytics data is correct, and most of our viewers are indeed between the ages of 18 and 30 and living somewhere in Europe, if you're watching this then you are probably a victim of the housing crisis. Chances are you've been priced out of home ownership and are just watching house prices go up and up while your crypto savings collapse. However, as interest rates rise and a recession looms, some analysts have started speculating about the possibility of a housing crash sometime in the near future, and in certain countries the cracks are already starting to show. So in this video we're going to ask whether a global housing crash is really a possibility, and what it might look like. By the way, this video was selected by Patreon backers, so thanks for that. Anyway, let's start with the three pieces of evidence that suggest a global housing crash is imminent. They are house prices are already high, interest rates are rising, and the fact that in some countries housing prices have already started falling. Anyway, let's start with high house prices. Globally, house prices have been going up since basically the last housing crisis in 2008. According to the IMF's Inflation Adjusted Global Housing Index, which basically measures how expensive houses are across the world, global house prices returned to their 2008 peak in 2017 and have continued to rise since. In their latest financial stability report from October 2021, the IMF warned that financial vulnerability in the housing market was, quote, elevated and that downside risk to house prices appear to be significant. In the worst case scenario, the IMF estimated a 14% drop in house prices in developed economies over three years, and a 22% drop in developing ones. In the paper, the IMF argue that the chances of some sort of housing bust are higher because house prices rose while the economy contracted over the pandemic, which suggests that demand for housing has become detached from what economists call the fundamentals. Essentially, the fact that houses were still selling over a recession suggests that people are buying houses for speculative gains, i.e. not because they needed the housing, but because they expect house prices to continue rising. Anyway, you get the point house prices across the world are rising precariously fast. However, it's worth noting that some countries have been worse affected than others. New Zealand, for example, has seen a 46% increase in house prices over the last two years, and the median house price in places like Wellington and Auckland is now over 10 times the median income. This measure of housing affordability, where you divide the median house price by the median income, is known as the median multiple, and we'll be using it a fair bit in this video. So remember it. Canada is another country where house prices are worryingly high. House prices have risen 50% in the last two years, and the median multiple in Toronto has risen to an all-time high of 17, making Toronto one of the most unaffordable cities in the world. So you get the idea, house prices are already high, and especially so in certain countries. On to the second reason, interest rate hikes. As inflation picks up, central banks across the world have been raising interest rates to cause down the economy. This is bad news for housing markets for a few reasons. First, and most obviously, it increases mortgage servicing costs for those homeowners with variable rate mortgages. Basically, if you haven't got a fixed mortgage rate, you've now got to pay more money to keep your house, which increases the risk of default. This is particularly bad news for countries like Norway, Sweden and Australia, where the majority of homeowners have variable rate mortgages. Second, it makes it harder for new buyers to get onto the market, because new mortgages are more expensive, which reduces demand. But third, and most importantly, interest rate hikes usually mean recessions, and recessions usually mean very low demand for housing, because, well, everyone's poorer. A lot here depends on how much further central banks raise interest rates, and in turn depend on stuff like China's zero Covid strategy and Putin's war in Ukraine, which are both contributing to inflation. If events continue to funk with global supply chains and rates rise higher, the housing market will be at risk. On to the third bit of evidence, the fact that the housing crash has already started in some countries. China is the most obvious example here. As we've detailed in previous videos, China's property market is the most inflated in the world, with medium multiples above 40 in cities like Beijing and Shenzhen. Various Chinese property developers like Evergrande have defaulted or come close to in the past six months, after the CCP cracked down on excessive borrowing practices and housing demand has subsequently dried up. 
New home sales have collapsed, causing the value of land sold by local governments to crater by an astonishing 72% in the last year. The CCP has tried to stem the collapse by scrapping a long-awaited property tax and loosening mortgage requirements. But home prices are still falling, and developers have stopped building. If China's property bubble were to burst, it would be huge. Property accounts for an estimated 75% of total Chinese household wealth, and about 25% of all economic activity. It's a similar story in New Zealand. The number of homes sold in April was down 30% from March, with prices falling by 1.1%, now down 5% from their November peak. Two of the country's largest banks, Westpac and ASB, have now both sounded the alarm, with Westpac predicting a 20% fall in prices over the next few months. Anyway, those are the three reasons to expect a crash. But before you sell, keep in mind that there are some counter-arguments. First, household balance sheets are in better shape than they were in 2008, at least in most countries. In the US, for example, households have far more disposable income than they did in 2008, relative to their amount of housing equity. It's a similar story in most other large economies. In Germany, the UK and Australia, debt servicing costs are significantly lower than they were before the last housing crash. Now, this isn't true everywhere. Some countries, like Korea, Sweden and France, have higher debt servicing costs than last time round. But generally, households are in better shape than they were in 2007 and 8. This is partly due to stricter lending practices. The average credit score for an American taking out a government-backed mortgage is now a lot higher than it was in 2008, and Eurozone banks tightened credit standards in 2020. The second piece of evidence against a housing crash is that there might well be a genuine housing shortage. Across the developed world, people are building less houses, and this problem has been exacerbated by recent supply chain issues. For example, the war in Ukraine pushed US lumber prices up 14%, and the increased cost of energy won't have helped construction either. The point we're making is that supply-side inflation cuts both ways. Sure, it means higher interest rates, which means less demand for housing, but it also means less material, so less supply. The third reason not to expect a housing crash, though, is the government. Governments around the world have proved remarkably reluctant to let their property markets cool down, even if they're already inflated. The UK government, for example, has replaced its original plans to loosen planning and build more houses with more demand-side policies like help to buy, which will only inflate house prices further. China's government is going down a similar route, scrapping much-needed reforms to avoid bursting their property bubble. The point we're making is that if a property crash becomes a real possibility, you can expect governments around the world to do everything in their power to prevent it. Now, there's a debate to be had about whether this makes sense as a policy, but it's at least true that this policy posture is bad news for those of us who can't afford a house. All in all, while the risk of a global housing crisis is certainly elevated, especially in certain countries, there are reasons to be sceptical. Ultimately, a lot will depend on stuff like the war in Ukraine or China's Covid policy, so there's no way out of saying for sure, but if you happen to own a house, it might be worth keeping an eye out. If all this economic chaos is just too much, you ought to check out Brilliant. Brilliant is an online STEM learning platform that teaches you everything you need to know to better understand the modern world. Baffled by investment and finance? Well, they've got courses on maths and quantitative finance. Confused by coding? Well, they've got everything from the very basics right through to quantum computing. Unclear why you're losing millions? Well, there's no guarantee that Brilliant can help with that, but they do have courses on cryptocurrency and gambling. You get the point. Everything you want to learn about STEM is covered by Brilliant. And the best thing is that all of their courses are designed by award-winning instructors and built upon the principle of active learning. So you're gaining STEM knowledge by actually doing it. So if you want to improve with STEM, then you can sign up to Brilliant at brilliant.org forward slash TLDR global. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for supporting the channel.